G'day, you mob, and welcome to this episode of Aussie English. I am your host, Pete, and this is another episode of the Aussie English podcast where I have the incredible pleasure of interviewing today's guests, Rebecca Howie and Penelope Wilson from Language Lovers Australia and the Language Chats podcast. Now, Beck and Penn recently got in contact with me and asked if I could be on their podcast so that, you know, they could pick my brains about what it's like teaching Australian English as well as learning foreign languages like French and Portuguese. So, if you want to go and check that out, look up the podcast Language Chats and I believe it is episode 45, if I'm not mistaken. So, go check that out, have a listen and subscribe to their podcast. But in today's episode, I wanted to get them on my podcast to talk about what it's like being Australian, growing up in Australia and learning foreign languages. What's the experience like learning languages at schools, at university? And then what is it like trying to learn it on your own as an Aussie when, you know, a lot of the time we're surrounded by other Australians and it's hard to decide which language do you learn? Why do you learn it? Everything like that. So, we cover a whole bunch of topics, including obviously the ones I've just covered. We talk about how to stay motivated, how to stay disciplined, how to stay on track, how to get out of the intermediate plateau, how to choose good TV series, everything like that. So, without any further ado, guys, smack the bird and let's get into this episode. G'day, you mob. Welcome to this episode of Aussie English. Today, I have special guests, Beck and Penny from the Language Lovers Australia podcast. Beck and Penny, welcome to the podcast. How are you going? Thanks, Pete. Nice to be here. Thanks, Pete. Good to be here. A bit of a delay. (laughs) We've been battling the, uh, the internet trolls and demons i think tonight haven't we guys so um we'll see how we go and i should mention straight uh, straight ahead i've got a um a lozenger in my mouth so i am really hoping there's no sounds coming through but it's because i've lost my voice for the last two weeks we had to reschedule but we're here now so guys can we start off by you, you telling us a little bit about um yourselves obviously and uh language lovers australia and how it got started well we um we met um at the beginning of 2018. We met online actually through a language conference. Beck was presenting, and I was I was at home watching on my computer, and I saw this uh, this other woman presenting. I'm like, hey, she's from Melbourne. I need to connect with her. <laughs> so we eventually arranged to catch up in person, and we discovered we both have a love for learning languages. And we just chatted and and got on and we decided to bring together other people that love learning languages here in Australia. And that's how we came up with the idea for Language Lovers AU. So we pretty much just started to get people, um, well, initially just to get people together online. um, And we opened up a Facebook group, um, which is still there. We still very still quite active um that's the language lovers au community and we just sort of thought well let's just see whether there are some other people who want to like chat language and (laughs) are interested in you know sharing a little bit about what they're doing and what they're learning and whether they've got any resources or interesting things just to to share about what's happening with languages in australia so we started it there um and then we started uh well t- two things i guess kind of around about the same time we started organizing a few like little in person um catch ups and some little in person events just to get some language lovers into physically the same places obviously that's changed a little bit with everything that's happened in the last <laughs> 18 months um but then we also started our podcast which is called language chats and um that was also just to help share um, some stories of both our own experiences, but also of other Australians um, and and a few international guests as well. Um, but other people who were working with languages, learning languages, just to kind of, I guess, open up the world a little bit um, here in Australia to show that there are other Australians who are interested in languages other than English and that they're interested in learning them and they're interested in doing things with them and interested in communicating in them. So, what was your, for for both of you, we can start with you, Penny, what was your sort of background growing up with learning languages? I think we spoke about this on your podcast, so quick plug for that, guys, go and check it out where these guys interviewed me. 
Um, but we were talking about obviously my experience going through school and learning different languages. What was it like for for you, Penny? Well, I started off learning learning French um, and Japanese in in school, and I really took a liking to Japanese, and I, I can't really work out why. But I yeah took Japanese right through to year twelve and on to uni as well, and I was lucky enough to spend a year living in Vietnam after high school. And I really fell in love with Vietnamese and Vietnam and the whole country. So I ended up doing a languages degree with um, Japanese and Vietnamese and a bit of linguistics as well, which is not my my strong point. Um, And then, you know, after graduating and then going, what the hell am I going to do with my languages degree? I spent some more time abroad back in Vietnam and I thought tourism was what I wanted to end up doing. So I came back to uni and did did a Masters of Tourism, then ended up working in tourism for years and never got to use my languages <laughs> um, <laughs> until I, I left tourism and worked in wine. And um, I worked for a boss who spoke really good Mandarin Chinese and um, I decided that was going to be my next language challenge. So I uh, took off to China and- Just hard mode. Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> so out of those three, which is easiest? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, w- I would imagine you'd say Vietnamese because at least they use, um, what would you call it, like Latin-based alphabet, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that is a huge bonus for Vietnamese. The pronunciation of Vietnamese is pretty brutal, though. Mm-hmm. Um, but then Japanese pronunciation is awesome, but, you know, the, the alphabets mm-hmm. and the characters is hardcore and the grammar. Chinese grammar is a lot easier, but the characters are just insane. So I don't know. It depends. Ask me on different days. I probably have different answers. <laughs> I always, I always wondered that. And and sorry, Beck, we'll get to you as well. I always wondered with Chinese how they sound out words. Like, do you just come across words that you, you're reading a book and there's no way of really knowing how they're said? Like, you you might have hints from the shape of the character. From my memory of um, year eight to year eleven Chinese, Mandarin Chinese. But I always wondered, like, because we can at least sound the word out when we see it and we might mispronounce it, but we'll be like, oh, okay, okay, I can hear what I'm meant to be, what it's meant to mean. But with Mandarin Chinese, it's not that way, right? Yeah. So I I think, you know, to to read, you know, a simple book or article, you need to know, you know, a couple of thousand characters because Uh you're going to come across words that you've never seen before. Um, and like you said, there's no real way of deducing what what that word is unless unless you've got a sense of what you can see in the character. So, yeah, a lot of rote rote learning and and practice and yeah. Well, it was funny. I, <laughs> I remember getting going through Portuguese after French, learning those two languages, and French is sort of like English, where the spelling is kind of all over the place with pronunciation. So there's no real shortcuts. But with Portuguese, it's pretty much phonetic. And I I remember asking my wife, "Do you guys have like?" problems like with kids pronouncing things and and you know um sounding words out and she's like no <laughs> and I was like man that was the bane of our existence going through high school and having to do spelling tests because of the damn schwa that we use in English so the schwa can replace any vowel sound in English and so a lot of the time like I remember I probably didn't even learn how to spell independent you know with I think all E's right there's no A's in there or O's in there until I was probably 23 years old so it was just funny that that was such a unique thing to English that I never realized until I started learning foreign languages but what about you Beck how did you go through um through school learning languages and here in Australia Mm. so I'm almost the opposite of Penny from the like at the start so (laughs) I also did French and then some Japanese later but I ended up gravitating to French so Um, I had quite luckily French through basically my entire schooling. Um, that was the the language that we started with at, you know, five years old. Um, and then Japanese and Indonesian got introduced later, but yeah. I sort of stuck with Japanese as my second language, um, did that for a few years. And then I was like, nah, I think I'm going to hang, I think I'm going to stick with French. Um, <laughs> and I really enjoyed it. I sort of as I started to learn more, so I had actually like in primary school, I hated French. I just thought it was stupid and useless and I was sick of learning like pencil, rubber and ruler (laughs) over and over again every year. I was so bored. And then in year seven, we like for the very first time learnt two verbs. We learnt to have and to be 
And I felt like this world just like opened up to me. I, I realized that I could formulate an actual sentence on its own. Um, and kind of from there, I started to get really interested because I realized that I could use this other language to say the same things that I wanted to say in English, but it was almost like speaking in another code, say <laughs> something, you know, the same thing again. Um, and so that for me was a really exciting time. Um, and I, um, yeah, continued on with French and then d- did a diploma in French at uni as well, um, kind of alongside my my main studies, which were completely unrelated and not at all to do with languages. I studied engineering. It was like just the opposite <laughs> end of the scale. You, you and I sound like we're in the same boat. <laughs> I, I went through high school doing French and then went to uni and did the diploma on the side and failed it because I just hated how French is taught <laughs> at, at the university. And I just, didn't, I didn't go to the exams and I got a 45 on one of them. And I was like, damn, I should have just gone and written my name on the exam and I would have passed that subject. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny because like, Definitely for me, like now I I look back on the years that I did French at uni and actually I I don't think I realised this at the time, but I now realise that it was so important that actually I kept doing some language study when I was at uni that wasn't all of the other really, to be honest, like really mathsy, very technical um, kind of learning that I had to do. I really needed that other part of my brain still working and functioning. Which is like a break, right? And so I'm quite like, yeah, exactly. I'm quite grateful for that, even though the actual content of those subjects was sometimes really like really academic and very often really literature based. Sometimes they were cultural subjects, but like they were not always the most engaging um, content really did did you Um, based on it did did kind of mean that I had a good reason to continue with it based on based on that did you go to Melbourne University yeah I did I did (laughs) I knew that as soon as you said engineering and a side diploma in French because I was that's where I was and I was doing it in biology and a side diploma in in French so but I I remember the same problems I had I freaking (laughs) hated learning literature from you know the 1800s in in French I was like I just want to be able to speak to people all I want to do is get good enough to be able to speak to people and I'm like I don't want to learn about all these old poems and this old literature stuff I just want to be able to speak but they were like it's it's a mandatory subject so I'm, I'm impressed you stuck with it though Awesome. All right. So, how did you find um, the teaching? Yeah, uh, 100%. Oh, we've got some delay. <laughs> it's okay. Do you want to kill your video and see if I'm that so makes a sorry. difference? I'm so sorry. I feel no, like it's my silly. internet. Man, I, you don't know how many times D- I've been yes. on this end. <laughs> yeah, let's kill my video. All right. Yeah. How, can I'll you hear me now? Well. My bad. Um, That's better. Yeah, I've just, turned, I've just better. turned off my video. So, hopefully, is it? Okay, great. Let's let's keep it that way, Ben. I'm sure, so I'll sorry. Mine as well. No, don't be silly. Just, it just must do- be because it's um maybe because it's like peak as well. Like I know. I don't know if everyone's just like streaming Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how did you guys find the the teaching of languages at high school too? Because this is one of those things that I think once you get into the polyglot community, you hear a lot about people ragging on how languages are taught in all schools, but at least from personal experience, I found that the the classrooms in Australia tended to be um, really bad uh, in terms of motivating students and catering to their the way that they learn languages. So what was your sort of experience with that through high school? Did you have great teachers, horrible teachers? Was it motivating? I think um, for me, it was a bit up and down because I think Beck was talking about this before as well, that I think where there's a problem in Australia is we don't seem to have like a continuity thing right you, you you know not every kid in every school will learn the same language so if you move schools or move cities then you've got to start from scratch so I felt like we were repeating a lot of stuff a lot of stuff time was spent on the basic the basic parts of the language um, but for me, I just found the Japanese side of things. I just really loved it because it was so different 
And I think that's what was appealing. So I probably didn't care whether the teaching was bad or not. And I got to go to Japan on a little exchange. So it was, <laughs> it was a nice, a nice treat as well. What about you, Beck? Yeah, uh, for me, I, again, probably a little bit up and down here and there, but overall, I had quite a positive experience with learning, well, with learning both French and Japanese at school, uh, but I really, like, I enjoyed it. I think I was an engaged student, like, I mm-hmm. could kind of see that I was getting something out of the the learning, and so that kind of made me want to search out other things on my own, yeah. and I think that, like, as I sort of you know, by the time I'd gotten to about 15 or 16 years old, like I was outside of the classroom looking for more. And then, you know, when you've got encouraging teachers who kind of, you know, can see that you are already interested, then sometimes they start to to give you a little extra because they they can see that you're you're going to take it somewhere and you know, that you want to go further with it. So, like, I think I think broadly, I had a really positive experience. But I can I, I know exactly what you mean because I think that. You know, if I think about the experiences of some of my peers, some of my friends, um, you know, they would probably say that it was very, very different. Yeah, it was always weird for me, at least. I remember seeing a few students and they would come in and do these classes and sometimes the teachers would just be like, Carl, I don't know why you're here. You know, you're not good at languages. And it would just be like, why Why would you say that to the dude? You don't know what he's, you know, he speaks English. So, it just seemed to be a very weird sort of environment, but um, I went to a pretty um, snobby sort of school. So I don't know, maybe it was just what it was like there. But um, yeah, so could you give us a background, Penn, on on what it's like in Australia with language learning as a whole? Are you likely to meet many people who are bi or trilingual out and about, or is it a bit of a rarity? I think... Um... I think we're lucky enough we get to meet people who are bilingual and trilingual all the time, but I, I'm not sure that it's celebrated like maybe it should be. Mm. Um, and I think maybe in Australia we have this tendency to overlook people's um, heritage languages or how they grew up in a multilingual environment at home and we perhaps don't give that enough credit. Um, and then I think, I, yeah, I don't know if we talk about language learning that much in Australia. Maybe that's just me, but that's kind of mm. that's kind of how I feel. Yeah, I agree. I think it's it's always been a bit of a struggle. Um, t- well, for, for schools, for teachers, for really anyone, um, to make sure that languages are a priority. Um, you know, it's very, I guess, despite the fact that yeah, like many, many, many people in Australia um, speak another another language maybe more than just one other language. Um, it, we live in a very English-focused society. Um, and as Penny said, it's more like, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could celebrate even more um, and show that it's normal in Australia for people to speak more than one language? Because I think that's what, even though actually so many people do speak another language, we don't talk about that all that often. What do you think that is? Is it a... Is it related to the amount of migration that we've had of people from everywhere and there isn't just one huge group of people who speak one other language that we can just say, you know, like if the Indigenous people in Australia all spoke a single dialect of, um, you know, the Indigenous language, I think that would be, it would be a completely different story, right? Because we would all be learning that at at school, Um, we would be holding it up, but the problem is that we have over 260 languages or something here when the first fleet arrived, so there is no single Indigenous language that any group can or any school can really teach that, that isn't just the, the local tribe. Yeah, I think, like, look, personally, I feel like there's so much beauty and diversity. I, d- I don't actually think that it's necessarily about what what you necessarily put forward in front of people, like the language, there doesn't need to be a dominant. Um, just even having the awareness that, like, other people around you can feel comfortable sharing that they speak another language, that they can, you know, speak another language with their family in in public and for that to be totally normal. Mm -hmm. Um, For me, that is what's important. It's actually just the awareness um, and feeling like, yeah, you know, I, you know, maybe wherever it is that you work or whatever school you go to or wherever it is that you study, just thinking like, well, yeah, like English is a common language for all of us, but I'm well aware that there are a bunch of other people around me who speak other languages and that they're comfortable doing that and that's part of their lives. 
I, I love it. I speak Portuguese every time I go out with my family. And it's so interesting to see the looks on people's faces, especially when I switch between the two languages and they'll hear me with an Australian accent and then be like, wait, what? <laughs> and, but, the, but the cool thing is that a lot of the time I notice this and I, it's funny depending on which side of the fence you are, because I'm Australian, I love when people get curious about what we're speaking, you know, which language we're speaking, what we're saying. So especially it seems like older women tend to be the more curious and willing to ask. They'll be like, oh, what, what language are you speaking, you know, with your son and, and your wife there? And, and we'll get into this conversation about, oh, my wife's from Brazil and we're raising our kid to be bilingual. And the, the cute thing that I notice a lot of the time is that they'll often say, how do I say hello or how do I say goodbye to you guys? And when we leave a cafe or something, they'll say, you know, ciao, ciao, até próxima. Like until next time, they'll want to learn something. So they're curious. But on the other side of the fence, my wife will be, always be like, oh, these nosy people want to know where I'm from and make me feel like I'm, you know, not Australian. <laughs> and I'm like, no, that's not what they're trying to do, right? They're just curious. Like uh, it, it is funny depending on which side of the fence you sit. So have you noticed that at all? Or do you find that there is this sort of stereotype that seems to be thrown around a lot of the time that Australians don't really like? Um, you know, people speaking foreign languages or a sort of wary. I think there's a, yeah, definite curiosity. I love it as well. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's a, that's a really cool story. And I think it's great if people ask or, or approach and, and find out a bit more about um, what you're saying or where you're from or that kind of thing, as long as, I guess, as long as the person receiving that interaction is happy for it to take place. Um, but, yeah, that's been I guess my experience as well, but I think it might come down to Pete, like where where you are in Australia too. That might have a, a bearing a bearing on that. Yeah, absolutely. As people who have, I think all three of us have spent lots of time in Melbourne. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Melbourne is a we have lots of lots of people from many different cultures. There are lots of languages floating around, and so you know, in some ways, people probably hear a very used to that kind of, um, yep. you know, society. Um, and in, in lots of other places, maybe that's just less so. But I do, I do think people increasingly over time, especially over, you know, you know in the last, the, especially the last like probably 30 or 40 years, yep. I think the openness of people towards other cultures and other languages has gotten significantly greater. And that is, that is a really positive thing. Yeah, I always found that it's interesting when you see the media tends to skew things a lot of the time, particularly with the the sort of stereotype of Australia being really racist. And then on the other side, like I've got, you know, a whole listenership and, and viewership of people who have actively chosen to migrate to Australia. And you would think if it was such a racist place, there would be, you know, no one interested in doing it. And so it's always interesting seeing how those two things don't really jive with one another. But I do the media does affect how we see ourselves, I think, as the Australians that have grown up here a lot of the time. So, I don't know. It's just interesting that I've noticed that in, in the past and I'll chat to my my viewers and listeners and they'll be like, this place isn't anywhere near as racist as where I came from. Like, what are you talking about? I haven't, I haven't experienced that or this or, you know, people tend to be curious and really interested and for the most part, yeah, pretty accepting. Yeah, I guess sometimes the negative voices can be very loud, you know, like they're, um, sometimes when, when people have a particularly, I don't know, you know, so sometimes people have racist views, it's like there are actually not very many people. There's just mm. a, a minority, but they are just particularly loud. I'm, um, so, I'm still waiting for the moment that someone just says to me, you know, hey, in Australia, mate, we speak fucking English. And, I, and I'll just switch from Portuguese and be like, what are you smoking, dude? <laughs> like, I'm, <laughs> like I'm still, I'm almost wanting that to occur at some point just so that I can shock someone and be like, what are you talking about, mate? You know? <laughs> That'd be good. That'd be good. <laughs> I know. So what has it been like for you guys as obviously English native speakers learning foreign languages. I think we talked about this on your podcast and my views on this, but have you guys noticed, especially in the the polyglot community where a lot of the really talented polyglots tend to not have English as their native language, have you noticed big differences between what it is to learn a foreign language when English is your native language versus when it's not? Oh, good question. I I don't know if I I have noticed a difference um, with that, but I think 
a lot of the, I guess, the language lover and language learner type people that that um, we hang out with are also Aussie based. And then obviously there's a huge community online as well throughout the world of um, polyglots and and multilingual people. Um, and yeah, they come from all different countries and all different language backgrounds. But I think it's just a really accepting and, and welcoming community. I, I think that's been my experience anyway. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Penny. I think it's it's a very, very welcoming, this online community of people who are interested in languages um, is just a really, really welcoming place. And I have to say that like it's, I feel like I say that like I'm like I'm surprised. I, I've known now for a long time that it, that is the case. Um, but <laughs> it, it, I think you know when you've been watching videos on YouTube of like you know hyperpolyglots and people who speak lots of languages or whatever, it can feel really intimidating. You kind of see these people with these like incredible skills, and you're like, oh my goodness, I could never be like that like how how could you speak so many languages and be so like proficient in all of them um but the fact is that there are there are so many people who speak many languages they're not like standing there looking down on everybody else who can't speak as many languages as they can or like people who are monolingual they're not they're just encouraging of everybody to to be like no go go ahead and try it like <laughs> you can you can learn how to how to speak another language too and i think that's that's the real kind of beauty of that community it's that there is at its for the most part there is no there really isn't much judgment yeah people are just genuinely encouraging and they want to kind of make sure that you feel encouraged as well um, and that you don't feel like you are being judged by by native speakers or or other people who just happen to have learnt one or twenty more languages than you. They're just like, <laughs> hey, go for it! Like, good job. <laughs> I guess I guess that what I was trying to get at is that there's. I feel like a lot of a lot of foreigners or a lot of people who speak a different language from English, the they've always had the obvious choice of if I'm going to learn, if I'm going to pick up another language at school, if I'm going to learn another language, it'll be English. And when I learn English or when I start learning English, it's always, I think pretty much, I think it must be the case that across all languages and cultures, once you start learning things in English, there's going to be more TV shows, more music, more books, more literature, more internet websites, so that you have way more content accessible to you in, in English. And as a result, it's kind of like this acceleration that I found, at least with a few people that I've spoken to about this, where they were like, as soon as I started getting the basics of English, I was like, holy crap, there's so much content about the things that I'm really passionate about that it made English learning English so much easier. And then I'll tell them, I totally don't have that situation in Portuguese. <laughs> like mm-hmm. I'm, I've, I'm I, as an English speaker, if I want to just, you know, read Harry Potter or watch the most popular TV shows or movies, th- granted, there are definitely some in, in Portuguese, in Brazilian Portuguese, but it's going down a funnel, right? Out of, out of all of the content that is in English online and everything like that, I have to now go really out of my way to try and find literature and books and, um, you know, interesting TV shows that might be blocked on Netflix that I can't find in the Australian Netflix that I have to download illegally or so it makes life a lot harder for me as an English speaker trying to learn a foreign language. So I was um, just wondering in that sort of respect, have you guys found it more difficult, um, you know, to, to pick up the foreign languages that you've been working on or has it been a completely different experience for you guys? I think for me, it, so it entirely depends on the language. Yeah. Um, and I kind of, I think that actually whether it's, it, it doesn't matter what the language is, once you have learnt a second language or once you have started learning and, you know, made some real progress with learning a second language, everything does get a little bit better from there. So like whether that is English, if you're not an English native speaker, or whether that is another language, if you are an English native speaker like like us, um, it's actually just taking that first step out of your native language that is the first part. So, like, that's once you realise that, like, this is possible, I can do this, it's actually not as completely, like, terrifying as I thought it might have been in the first place. Like, yeah, that's the first step to take. 
But then in terms of like finding content, finding resources and kind of being supported, I suppose, in that yeah. way with your with your learning, like, look, I'm not sure of the exact numbers and like the actual level of content, but to be honest, with something like, um, like I'm still actively learning German. And I think I would you say, mentioned that you were I learning Danish find... as well, right? And that was, that's obviously yeah, got very yeah. few speakers. So actually, <laughs> yeah. So I was going to say that that's probably a good contrast, right? So I'm, I'm mm-hmm. actively learning both of those languages at the moment, but I've been learning German for a lot longer than I have been learning Danish. I only started learning Danish earlier this year. And the, there is a huge contrast between what I can find available online or elsewhere in German yeah. Compared to what I can find available for me to listen, to watch, read, um, view um, in in Danish, like the the amount of stuff is just so much lower. And in, in um, Danish, yeah, in Danish, like it's just a a, a, a whole another challenge, like a layer a layer of challenge um, on actually learning the languages and finding the kind of content that I want to be able to engage with. Um, I guess that the added difficulty there too is that the Scandinavian languages, well, cultures and countries tend to have a reputation for being incredibly good at English from a very young age (laughs) where they're effectively native speakers of it. And so they just watch and consume all of the English stuff anyway, which, you know, probably undercuts a lot of the reasons that they would otherwise create their own content in in Danish, right? Like yeah. if you're an up-and-coming Danish filmmaker, you're going to be like, well, I speak English like a native, so I'm just going to do it in English. Well, and yeah, look, you're probably right, but that's also not to say like it's just like there is there is less content, but there is content to be found. Yeah. So like I suppose you just have to like with something like for, for, so for English learners, it's really easy to find content. And you're right, like that is something that helps with people who are learning. Well, this is where um, I get English envy, right? I'm always yeah, like, you guys, yeah, you guys yeah. have so much stuff to choose from. Whereas I'm yeah. like searching the website, like how do I find good Portuguese books? Damn it. I know it. <laughs> I asked my wife and she's like, I don't know. I read everything in English. <laughs> Great. 100%. <Thanks. laughs> so how's it been for you, Penn? Is it the same thing with um, Asian languages like Mandarin, Chinese, Vietnamese, and Japanese? Because I would imagine Japanese and Chinese would have huge amounts of, of um, content for you to dive into. Yeah, for sure. And I think, I think it's a different challenge with, with maybe particularly Chinese is, is trying to find content that's really engaging or that's really interesting or things that I really, really, really want to watch and get into because um yeah some of the stuff like if you're into like you know martial arts or like <laughs> cool like you know historical kind of drama I was going to say to you is it possible to learn japanese without liking anime <laughs> <laughs> Exactly I know and um and you know there's some there's some kind of fun reality shows to watch as well and yeah. um but you know I think if you can find something that you like and then stick with it um then that's a good thing. And, I mean, Vietnamese is a little bit different too. There's, they haven't really found that much stuff to watch in Vietnamese, to be honest. Um, but I know it's out there. Um, so I was going to say too, Pete, that there's a, there's this thing about like differences in motivations and, and yeah. drivers as well for, for language learners. And I, I feel like there's, there's someone like me who – is learning languages purely for, I guess, for fun and as a hobby and as something that I really love to do. And I'm not, my driver is not because my my, my husband or my in-laws are from, from China or yeah. that, that I'm, you know, moving to Vietnam next year for a job or for any of those kind of motivations that another learner might have. Um, and I think that's, you know, it's a really kind of important underlying thing as well to, to look at. Is that a gift and a curse in, in a way that it's kind of like you don't have really, really high stakes um, so that, it, 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 you know, you, you're not going to suffer mm. career-wise or anything like that if your Japanese doesn't get to, you know, B2 level or whatever by a certain amount of time? But is it also a double-edged blade where you're kind of like, well, I don't have that intrinsic motivation or sort of threat or, or fear that 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 yeah. is going to push me to to have to get to a certain level. I think you're right, and I think again for someone like me who really likes that extrinsic, you know, 
push and motivation um, that you have to kind of find it in other ways. Yeah. Um, so it's not for everyone, but I have done a couple of exams as well in the past to kind of keep me on track and to have a goal and a deadline to aim for. Wow. Um, so it's, yeah, I guess it's just ways of, of finding, you know, ways that work for for you and uh, you know it's funny because I'm not an exam person at all but it's funny that that seems to work for me <laughs> well I think I think I probably need to take a page out of your book right or a leaf out of your book because uh, <laughs> with Portuguese I think I was was talking about this with you with you guys but um I think it was within the first year of learning with my wife I made 95 percent of my gains with mm. with the language and then after that all the stuff that we talked about on a daily basis was pretty much covered and there was no real unless we went out of our way to be like, okay, this news article's come up about this certain topic, you know, um, and it's really outside of our wheelhouse of comfort <laughs> in either language. So we're going to have to try and work through this in the hard way. Uh, nothing new comes up unless, unless we do that. And so it's been, it's been really interesting. I think that's the kind of, it's sort of an equivalent to the intermediate plateau where I feel mm. like for Portuguese and me, I'm, I feel like I'm proficient in the language but I have all these sort of blind spots where I'm just not comfortable at all because I haven't spent any time there, but I need to, I, I need to find a way to force myself to get out of my comfort zone and, and to, to find time or to make time to actually go out and, and learn these things. So I probably should try and find a way of doing an exam or something, but um, Beck, do you have any sort of advice for, for staying motivated and to continuing to improve in these languages after a certain amount of time, you know, after maybe you're stuck in that intermediate plateau? Yeah, so I think um, you've kind of always got to follow what you're interested in, right? Like yeah. the more the more that you can do things that you you want to talk about, things that you want to know more about, things that you want to learn the vocabulary for um, in the language that you're learning, the better your outcome is going to be. Um, so if you are like whatever it is that you're interested in, whatever activities you like to do, right? Like I love watching TV. I I, I love TV. I just can't. It's, it's like Seems like one of those things though, right, where, where everyone loves TV. Show me one person oh, who's like, I hate like, it. Yeah, but like I really, I really, really loves enjoy, it. Yeah, I really enjoy like watching TV and film. And I also, also I particularly enjoy watching dramas. Gotcha. So I, I like I like watching quite serious TV, um, <laughs> and you know I guess like subset of the of the very big TV universe. I really enjoy watching watching dramas, and for me that's the kind of content that gets me interested in the language. I will start watching a show, and I'll be like, "Wow, I freaking love this this language that I'm hearing in this TV show." I love the way it's being used. I'm in, interested in what they're talking about, especially if it's yeah. historical. Like mm -hmm. then I sort of get really quite interested too. And that will be where I'm going, okay, well, hmm, I start looking things up and then I start having a little bit of a dabble and then I start looking <laughs> and then I start looking up that specific vocabulary, but it's because I want to understand what the people in that TV show in that episode are saying. Yeah. Like I, I want to be able to follow like, you know, I'll start, you'll start picking out some, some words here and there. And then I'm like, hmm, where are the gaps? Like, what am I, I, have, I, what am I, I have an image here, here of you at night in bed with like all the lights off in the room. And there's just <laughs> the, the screen of the laptop, like lighting your face up. And on the screen, there's Netflix and there's Google Translate or, you know, another website uh, open so that you can just put the words in. Am I right? <laughs> yeah. Like shocking, embarrassing, but like. And totally... I did that. I do that every night at the moment with um Brazilian Netflix. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But so I like, you. I think you've got to, you you know, like, I mean, that, that's one particular example, but I think if you, you know, if you're interested in what it, whatever it might be, if you're, if your special, special topic <laughs> is K-pop, mm -hmm. you know, like pe people can get involved in a language purely because like, uh, like what Penny was saying before about motivation, why you're learning, you know, I know that people have started learning Korean in the last few years because they just love K-pop. They want to be able to understand all of the words to their favorite songs. Mm -hmm. I think that's such a cool reason to want to learn a language, right? It's because you want to engage on a deeper level with something that interests you. And, you know, the more that you can, the more that you can have that deeper feeling of being like, I know why I'm learning this. It's not just for, I'm not, I'm not learning something for the sake of it. 
I'm learning it because I want to be able to speak to more people about my favorite K-pop band or I'm learning English and I want to be able to improve my how I can speak at work with specific vocabulary because I need to be able to do that to get my next job or whatever. It's just having that quite specific thing in your mind that makes you want to say I'm going to learn some more and that so that you're not just feeling like completely demotivated all the time because otherwise, yeah, then you will just stop. So do you see it as really, really important to kind of find a reason to fall in love with the culture of the language or cultures of the language that you're learning? Because I found that that's a very important part of, of, I guess, nailing your motivation down too. Yeah, 100%. I think and when once you've got that, once you've got that idea in your mind about what it is that like kind of turns you on about that language, um, you know, you can start to develop your, your toolkit of resources that always make you feel interested. And as things, you know, things will come into that and drop out of that box as time goes on. Like you might be interested in a particular YouTuber or something who's like videos you just really love watching um, and that kind of gets you interested in, yeah. in their stuff for a while. But then, I don't know, they might stop making content. They might, you might just lose interest in their stuff, but you'll find something else. And as long as you've got some options available to yourself all of the time so that you don't just, you're not relying on one specific resource, as long as you have a few things at your disposal that you know that on, on a particular day, if you're not feeling resource number one, you can have a go at resource number two and that will still mean that you are learning something. Um, then that's kind of kind of key, I think, having a little bit of a, a toolbox of, of useful resources at your disposal. So do you, Penny, do you have any advice too for what it's what it, what to do when you do sort of get, I guess, a bit bored and sick of things and you know you you just can't be bothered anymore you feel like you're not getting any results are there certain tricks or tips or or pieces of advice that you would have for how to keep going because I've I've heard things when I was doing martial arts a lot of the time you know people like how do I stay motivated and they were like motivation Mm. sucks dude just stay disciplined you know most people don't wake up wanting to go to the gym but they know that that's the routine and what they need to do. And then once they finish training at the gym or doing whatever that's when they feel motivated (laughs) because they feel good after the fact. It's so hardcore, but it's kind of true, isn't it? That for me, um, because like I was saying, I do need to be kept on the straight and narrow. For me, I have (laughs) to um, schedule in whether it's italki classes or like a Zoom class with, with someone, with a teacher or with a tutor so that it's in my calendar. I've paid for it. So I actually have to turn up and be there. Um, That's something that works really well for me. Um, like I said before, registering for an exam, that sometimes can be a really good motivator. Um, and just mixing up your routine. So, <clears throat> excuse me, if you haven't been watching much TV or you haven't been doing much passive activities for a while, maybe just give yourself a break and just, you know, listen to some TV or podcast or radio without being really intentional about your learning and then yeah, give yourself a break, I think, every now and then. I think that's really important. Mm, such a good tip. I feel like when we were talking about finding the motivation, that that's sort of this, I, f- I keep seeing this image in my head of, um, I watched a documentary recently about arranged marriages. Don't know how I got there. Thanks, YouTube. And, um, you know, <laughs> that, that this is a cultural practice in India, at least, well, it's, it's cultural practice in a lot of different places, but this, this doco was set in India. And it's, for us in the West, it's a very, strange concept of this arranged marriage but the thing that kind of got me in the in the um the doco was when they were sort of explaining that well love is kind of a luxury and it's it's short-lived and uh, when we organize these arranged marriages the love comes later you sort of find that i guess it's sort of like the intrinsic motivation you discover later and you develop it and you build it over time as opposed to hoping that you know you fall in love with someone at first sight and it's going to work from then on, I feel like there's an analogy here between those sort of love at first sight and an arranged marriage um, with learning a language and then trying to be motivated. Motivated at first, say, because you think the language is really cool versus having to dive in and try and learn more about the culture and find these other sort of more intrinsic, interesting things that, that sort of connect you to the language that that, that love develops over time. Mm. So do you, do you sort of see mm. where I'm coming from? What do you reckon? I, I, I do. I, I, yeah, I agree. And travel's always been a really important part of my life and, and has kind of guided my language learning and spurred me on to continue language learning and been a really good motivator for 
me. So, um, yeah, I definitely can feel that with with what you're saying with that analogy as well. And it's really hard at the moment not having having that as an option as everyone around the world is in the same boat. Travelling or arranged marriages? Uh-huh, travelling. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's a it's a really good analogy. I like I like that um, that way of describing kind of a relationship that you might have with a language, um, because you're absolutely right. It can it can start from both of those places. It, it's not to say that the motivation has to be there right at the beginning. Sometimes you really just have to learn because you know you need it. You need well, that language I, I to be able to like move to another place. Exactly. That tends to be the the thing we I think the group of us here as, as English native speakers have that luxury of being like, Oh, nice, shiny thing. I want to learn that language. Mm. Whereas a lot of the people that are going to be listening to this podcast are probably like, well, I didn't inherently have any interest in English, but I bloody have to learn it because (laughs) you know, it's the, the world language. Yeah. But the, the good thing, like, so if you are in that position of not having the motivation, well, your motivation at, at the at the beginning is that you just have to do it. Yep. It's something that's important for you because, yeah, because you're moving to another country or because you need, you know, need it for work or whatever. The good thing about any language is that you can always, language language is a, is a mode of communication. So no matter where it is that you live, no matter what language it is that you speak, you can still experience all of the things that we have in life. With, through through whatever language it is that you speak comfortably. And that means that when you are learning another language, you can also experience all of the fun things that you like to experience in your native language in another language too. You just have to be able to find those things and get to a point where you can enjoy them as well. So I, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that just just because it might feel like a chore to begin with, it doesn't have to be because you should be able to still find all of the fun things that you enjoy in your native language um, through another language as well. Um, You just have to know what those things are and then they should hopefully carry you the rest of the way. I think you crushed it. (laughs) Finishing up, I I wanted to ask you guys if you have any good suggestions for Australian TV shows or movies. So I I have a fear that like myself, you're probably going to be like, I don't watch Australian TV or movies. (laughs) (laughs) Um, oh, there are some good ones. I don't know. Like, I mean, there are some classics. Some classics. I, I get I asked know. this question so often and I'm always like, man, I'm on Netflix either watching American stuff or Brazilian stuff. <laughs> like, I'm mm. totally out of the loop when it comes to Australian TV I, shows and movies. <laughs> there's there's always some good stuff, good stuff on ABC. Like, I view you can always download some good shows on there. I watched one last year called Total Control. I really like that with... um. Rachel Griffiths in it. It was a political kind of show uh, set in I think Canberra. I saw the yeah, yeah, I think I saw the was, ads for this. That was really good. And I really liked the comedy, The Let Down as well. That mm-hmm. was about pregnancy and, and childbirth and motherhood and parenthood. My wife's been um, watching that actually. <laughs> yeah, what else do I have to? Yeah, there's a lot of options. <laughs> I, I tend to point them towards iView as well. And um, I think I had someone ask the other day, how do I get to Australian TV shows if I'm living in Turkey? And I was like, just buy a VPN and use iView because mm. the, it's the ABC is the, um, what is it? The Australian Broadcasting Commission. And they just release all this stuff free on the internet effectively. So if you can get an Australian IP address on your computer, you yeah, can access totally. the website for free and watch the TV shows. And I think mm. they all have subtitles. So I'd have to say Bluey as well, Pete. Bluey's oh man, a great suggestion too. <laughs> uh, I've heard I've heard so many good things about Bluey. Not the being somebody that doesn't have kids, I have not gone out of my way to watch Bluey. Um, but I feel I feel like it's kind of the show of the moment. <laughs> it's pretty heartwarming. For it's kids? pretty heartwarming. Every it single is, one of the episodes has sort of a deeper message under there, and it gets you right in the sweet spot. Yeah. You're just like. Ugh! <laughs> I also, I think my, probably my, um, my recommendation for Australian, well, in this case, it's a film that I'm going to recommend, but um, this is quite recent, The Dry, which is a, Mm -hmm. a, you know, kind of a big, well, I mean, not Hollywood because it was all in Australia, but like, you know, Hollywood style kind of film. Um, Eric Banner. He's Eric Mm -hmm. Banner. Eric Banner. (laughs) Yeah. um, Who is the star of that movie. And that only came out Oh, probably six months ago, I want to say. And yep. I reckon that is the best Australian film I've seen in a long time. So I would really recommend it. Um, 
And it's also a, quite a good view of um, Australia outside of a city. In admittedly a very small town. Um, is, it, is this but, the film that's about uh, the drought and how farmers are kind of struggling in this small town to deal with with the drought? That is yes. an element of it, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, but it's, it's um a murder crime show kind of yeah, crime uh, exactly. Yeah. Bit of a bit of a murder mystery kind of who done it. But um very well done. It is a drama, it's serious. Um but <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> I love the way you said that. It's serious. It is, it's serious. <laughs> Just saying like you're not gonna get a comedy from yeah. this, like that's not what it is. Yeah, if you're it's, laughing it's... <laughs> whilst watching the dry, you have misunderstood what's going on. <laughs> Yeah, but it is, look, great film, really engaging um, and kind of an, an interesting, I think, view of Australia um, that's, you know, not necessarily the kind of beachy, the beachy Australia that people tend to think of, um, you know, as a stereotype. Awesome. Awesome, guys. Well, where can people find out more about you guys and, and the website you've got and the podcast you've got? So podcast-wise, you can just search for Language Chats in your podcast app and Language Lovers is languagelovers.com.au and Language Lovers AU on Facebook and on Instagram, languagelovers.au. Awesome. Well, I should ask, I forgot to ask you guys before we go, what (laughs) would you suggest is a way that we can get more Australians learning foreign languages? Oof. Million dollar mm. question, Pete. Mm, that's a good <laughs> one. Um, that is that is a really good question. I think we've got to make it less serious. Less serious. It's all about the fun. Take the pressure off. We don't need to be. If we're learning a language as a hobby, let's say, let's make it more fun and not make fluency the end goal necessarily to make it more achievable and feel less scary. Yep, I 100% agree with that. And I think that that's something that's really reflected in when people decide as an adult to start learning another language because of travel. Um, like, you know, people I think are very inspired, usually, um, <laughs> not not under the current circumstances, but <laughs> normally normally people do tend to be very inspired by their travels um, to want to learn another language. And, um, and I think that's because it is a really fun driven experience it's it's a real experience of getting into another place where you can you know use and see another language being used and you realize that you could potentially be a part of that as well but that it's not it's not about sitting down at a desk in front of a whiteboard and um you know taking exams it's it's just a fun communication experience with other people it's almost like it needs to be taken out of the classroom to some degree right Mm, and and uh people encouraged to go their own way yeah that's it yep Yep, totally. Awesome. Beck and Penn, thanks so much for joining me. And um, obviously, they mentioned where you guys can find them. So it's been a pleasure and I hope to have you guys on in the future. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Pete. Pete. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Pete. It's been a pleasure. All right, guys, massive thanks to Beck and Pan for coming on the podcast. Remember, you can check out their website, languagelovers.au at languagelovers.com.au. And be sure to go and check out my episode on their podcast, Language Chats, episode number 45. So, guys, thank you so much for joining me. I'm Pete. This is Aussie English, and I will see you in the next episode. Peace.